Thanks for joining us on the King Law Podcast, where we give you a lawyer's perspective on anything legal or not. From criminal law, personal injury, and trending legal topics, we're your back pocket legal guide. An exciting day. Exciting day. One of the ones we've been looking forward to for a long time. We, we don't get to talk to judges very often because they're not supposed to talk to us unless they're campaigning. So Justice Alex Renzi, New York State Supreme Court, a uh, longtime friend of mine, and I was assigned to be Justice Renzi's DA in the domestic violence court a long time ago, and I came uh, out of the Rochester City Court. We settled the case, and he pulled me into his chambers and said, we can either resolve all the cases or we can do trials here. And I think we did 12 trials in the next 12 weeks and uh, uh, just a, a trial judge. There's not many of them out there. Uh, a guy who goes to work every day and works really hard for all the people uh, that have elected him to the Supreme Court. I think you can tell us how many days you've been on trial in the last decade, but it's, I think it's more than any judge in, in the Supreme Court around here that I know of. Days on trial, I don't know, but I've done over 400 jury trials in my career, and I have more days on trial than anybody in the Seventh Judicial District in almost the entire state. Wow. Um, I average probably between 25 and 30 jury trials a year, and I've been doing this for a long time. I don't keep track of the trial days. The OCA keeps track of everything, but I don't. But I pride myself on my uh, hard work and and doing trials. I primarily do a lot of trials because I don't take a lot of plea bargains that are offered. I think that uh, if somebody didn't do something, go to trial, if they did it, then there's gonna have to be a consequence. So break that down for me a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's start. Oh, you wanna start? I wanna do the introduction, but I think (laughs) you ought to do your own introduction. I know know an awful lot about Judge Renzi, but you know, all the people that are listening, who are you and and, uh, what, what do we need to know? I won't go back too far. Went to Penfield High School, then I went to Syracuse University, then to Emory Law School in Atlanta. I went to uh, Emory because I wanted to go to a city that had an NHL hockey team. And the, the moment I got down to Atlanta, they moved to Calgary. So I never had my NHL, <laughs> NHL team, but I started like the, uh, the Braves, so baseball. After I left, uh, uh, Atlanta, came back to Rochester, got into the D- district attorney's office, three years there, then went to private practice, then in uh, 1991, went to the Henrietta Town bench. I was there for 12 and a half years. Then I ran for county court in uh, 2000, I lost. And then I r- ran again in 2002, so I ran three campaigns, 1999, 2000, and 2002. Three out of four years, I was on the campaign trail. But I won for county court. County court does only uh, criminal cases, pistol permits, some civil, some evictions, but not much, primarily a criminal court. And then in 2009, was elected to Supreme Court. 14 years went by, and I'm now on the campaign trail for re-election. You've done most of your time as a Supreme Court justice, also as a criminal calendar that's all I do is the criminal cases I should say that's all I do it when I initially started in Supreme Court I did a year of uh, uh, matrimonial well, two years of matrimonial I was also the matrimonial judge in Steuben County for seven years so I went down to Steuben County and I divorced the happy people down there and uh, but that was while I was doing criminal trials I only had to go down like three or four days a month to do the divorces so then it was just criminal trials. All the felonies that occur within uh, Monroe County, the murders, the rapes, the assaults, the felony drunk driving, the list goes on and on. You've seen it all. I have. More than I want to see, too. Oh, no. <laughs> so the way Judge Renzi, it, tell the, the, sometimes we call you a justice, sometimes we call you a judge. It's okay to call you a judge. You are judge, a judge is fine. You are a judge. Uh, but a justice is judge of the Supreme Court. Right, it's also a town position too, you're a justice of the peace or a town justice. So uh, the way we met, I was assigned to this domestic violence court, I was the prosecutor. So you had a Supreme Court judge who had done hundreds of trials and I was a relatively new DA. And we had Matt Clark, who was an experienced public defender. So they'd all been doing it, known each other for 20 years. And, uh, but 
I was the prosecutor, and we did we did an awful lot. Of, I think that one year I did twenty six jury trials in the domestic violence court. Yeah, you know who else did twenty six jury trials that year? The prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know who had to subpoena all those witnesses? The prosecutor. Yeah, but look at the great experience you got as a, an attorney. Correct. Which you need in that office. Yeah, and well, it was uh, it's unique in people. It's it's where I've always tried to give a tremendous amount of credit to you, Tom, Anna, um, helped me when I was a young lawyer. Because you don't know, you have to do 20 jury trials, especially in front of a judge. So I can, your instructions to juries, I, think I get them in. Nightmares. I mean, I know what you're going to say. The book's it's the same out. thing. The book's. I don't even out. need a book anymore. Oh yeah, that's so funny. So, uh, but was there a big difference between county court and supreme court for you? None whatsoever. It was just still just doing the criminal trials. Yeah. I mean, I think Tom's one of the the great clerks in the Hall of Justice in the state of New York. This is a guy who had a, a tremendous amount of experience himself as a prosecutor, a top level attorney, and then um, in a leadership role. And he's used to dealing with people and having that authority, maybe more so than, than some of the other clerks that don't have the experience. You see younger folks becoming clerks, and, and Tom's a little different than a lot of those people. He's one year younger than me, he's 64, and he has all that vast experience, and his ability to write is just second to none. Okay. So I'm lucky. So what type of cases do you enjoy being the judge over? Believe it or not, the, the, what I see on the bench is, much of it's very disturbing. There's nothing that, that I really like. I like doing the jury trials because I get to meet members of the community. I can bring 100 people into the, uh, a courtroom and I'll ask them every single time, how many people want to be here? Sometimes I get no hands raised, sometimes I get like five or six, but never more than 10% of the group is going to raise their hand saying that they want to be there. Yeah. And my job is to convince them that they want to be there, fulfill their civil obligation to this country, duty of citizenship, to get them to want to serve. And then when I'm done, I talk to them again, and I think most of them are always very grateful that they had a chance to see how the system works, that it's not like TV, and, mm -hmm. and it's a very different process that right. most of the community doesn't understand. It's a slower process. Very slow. It's not usually an takes hour a, episode. <laughs> no, it usually takes a day just to pick the jury. Mm -hmm. So I have 100 people sitting in the courtroom just going through a process and it's very time consuming and they have to show a lot of patience to get through it. Do you ever wonder when attorneys pick jurors, do you ever question like, oh, I wonder why they picked that person? Every single trial I do, I really? wonder why the prosecutor left this person on, why did the defensive person leave this person on? Like for instance, uh, just my last trial, the judge's secretary made it onto the jury. I'm not going to mention the judge's name, but that was, I didn't think he'd be left on. Prosecutor left on uh, a social worker, which I never thought would happen. Mm -hmm. Little things like that, but I don't say anything. Yeah. That I let them do the, the picking. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the most important part of the trial for the lawyers? It is jury selection. That's, that's what I thought Absolutely, 100%. You can lose a trial on jury selection or you can win a trial on jury selection. And when you say that, what do you mean by that? Explain to the people that are listening, you can win or lose, but it doesn't make sense because no, there's been no proof. But There's been no proof, but so many people come into service and they have an agenda. They have an oblique, a belief about the criminal justice system one way or the other that it's not a good system, that it's a racist system, or that it is a great system and they're pro-law enforcement and the other, the other side. And you have the two sides that come in there and you try to figure out where that person stands and their beliefs. And that's the job of the prosecutor, the defense attorney. They try to get somebody who they really think can be fair and impartial. Many times somebody makes it onto the jury who does have a political agenda is going to make a, a decision like they don't believe police officers or they really believe police officers police officers couldn't lie and the screening process is trying to narrow that out or get rid of those people but they make it on the jury it happens so the lawyers that do a good job most of the people who listen to us are lawyers people connected to our law students that's who um, so the lawyers that do a good job of jury selection what do you see over those 400 trials. Some, some of the lawyers are good at jury selection, some are not. I give 15 to 20 minutes for an attorney to talk to a panel of 21. 
which isn't a lot of time. And you have to aim those questions at somebody's background. Like, where do they do their volunteer work? Um, have you ever had a bad experience with the police? Have you ever contested a traffic ticket? Things like that. So you can bring out some biases or prejudice a person might have. And you have to spend time with these people to try to get them to open up rather than just sit there quietly, not answer any questions. And the attorneys who do a real good job spend that time or might give a hypothetical to bring out somebody's biases or prejudices. So one of the things that I learned is you ask the question and you get the answer that you're looking for. Maybe it shows a, a juror who's not good for you. Correct. And instead of trying to convince them, at, like what, what we were taught was, I really appreciate that comment. That's an excellent comment. Who else feels that way? Before Exactly. So you can, instead of getting the one person who's got the guts to put their hand up or you happen to strike on, well, now there's probably four or five people who feel the same way. You can get all five of them. And then trying to get them for cause, where which is... You know, to explain to the, the people, it's people. Cause people means they have a legal reason why they shouldn't sit. They're showing a bias or a prejudice yeah. that means they can't be fair and impartial. So the, the attorneys try to bring that out of a juror uh, so that the court will bounce them so they don't have to use one of their peremptory challenges. In every case, the attorneys have a certain number of what's called peremptory challenges where they can bounce somebody off the jury for whatever reason they want. In a murder case, you get 20. In certain high or serious felonies, you get 15, and the rest you get 10. So using those peremptory challenges is important, if you, but more important if you can excuse somebody for cause when you're doing the questioning to bring that out so you don't have to use a, a peremptory challenge. Hmm. Well, we're talking a lot about attorneys, but I have questions about judges. So in your opinion, I'm sure you work with a lot of other justices. What qualities make a good judge in your opinion in my opinion a judge a good judge is somebody who makes a decision right away they don't okay don't hem and haw about what they're going to decide or take a break to talk it over with the law clerks be able to make a decision and, and live by that decision that's really important and also you have to have patience if a new attorney is coming into my courtroom and they haven't practiced before. I'm not going to be mean to that person. I'm going to try. I'm not going to assist them in, in presenting their case or their defense. Um, but certainly, you have to show a lot more patience. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know a little compassion. <laughs> a little compassion, and it's a learning experience for them. When when Bob was doing his trials for the first time, he wasn't the the best at it. But as every trial went on, he did more and more. He became a better attorney and knew how to do it. Yeah. And the judge has to understand that. I feel like that's kind of a cool thing that you get to see is these attorneys grow and get better each trial they come through. Correct. I, the DA's office right now has a lot of really young attorneys and, and uh, they don't know their way around the courtroom yet. Mm -hmm. And it's very tough for them. And some of the judges are a little harder on them than I would be. You have to have... It's, it's not really compassion. It's just being sensitive to what they're going through. Because I used to do it. I used to be a defense attorney, and I did trials. And there's nothing worse for a defense attorney when you truly believe your client is innocent. It is. I've been there. And I know when these attorneys come in and they truly believe that their client is innocent, they go home and they're not sleeping at night. You know, if you know your client's guilty, you're going to have the best defense you can, but you're going to be able to sleep at night. Right. But when you really think somebody is not guilty and you and you go to the wall for them and you do everything you can, it was really tough on a defense attorney, and I really respect that for them. The prosecutor also believes that everybody's guilty. But that's why they're doing the case. Yeah. How, many, how many years did you defend cases? Twelve. So while you were... Town court justice. Or well, I was a town court justice. I was primarily a defense attorney, matrimonial attorney, and real estate attorney. Okay. Took a lot of assigned cases, did a lot of jury trials as a defense attorney. So what advice would you give to young lawyers or law students? Most importantly, if I, was, uh, I wanted to be a litigator, I would tell them to go watch some trials. And if they came to me, I would tell them to who to go watch. I'm not gonna give names out right now, but mm -hmm. I would tell them what attorneys are good to watch, what judges are good to watch. You need to experience it. Maybe if 
you knew another attorney was going to try a case, maybe go sit second chair with them, sit next to them, see what they go through, how they prepare, how to review discovery. Mm -hmm. Really important. I don't know if we should name drop many people that are working today in the Hall of Justice, but how about the lawyers when you were learning, when you were a defense attorney, the guys from part of the reason we started doing this in recording is I had I had lunch with John Speranza and Joan O'Byrne, and they started talking about practicing law in the 70s. And there was the A-team, B-team, and they were doing murder trials and having a, a good time. And we wanted to record what uh, people saw. So who are some of the people who were, were big shots when you were starting out? Well, you already mentioned Speranza. He was one of the best they did. Uh, Still is. The peer was one of the great ones. There was uh, the old timers. Chuck yeah. Crimmy. People talk about Chuck Crimmy. The Crimmy Awards given yeah. in his name because he was one of the best. Yeah. But there's, I, I can't think of a lot of the names, but there was the old timers who would come into court and you could feel their presence. Even though Tony Leonardo did a stint in jail, he could win over a jury and win the trial and jury selection because they just loved him. He looked like a million bucks. He sounded like a million bucks. And it didn't really matter what the case was because he could he could spin it in a, a way that jurors would just love him and believe him. And there's not many of those around anymore. And I'm not going to name names. <laughs> well, I, I really name names. As I said in the in the past, in the past. That's right. Yeah. Well, speaking of the past, if I can ask, or you yeah, no, no, go ahead. Um, what what are some impactful moments from your career? Well, it's got to be usually the high-profile ones, like I did the University of Rochester kidnapping case. That's where the two kids were kidnapped, they were shot, they were sexually abused. That was a couple-week-long trial, and uh, that was one of the hardest videos to watch because these uh, defendants recorded what they did to the victims. That was pretty disturbing. Speaking of disturbing videos, the most disturbing video I ever saw in a courtroom was when Denny Wright the police officer was stabbed in the eye and he had his body worn camera that had to watch several times and it was just really disturbing. I don't even know how the jurors could have uh, handled that and sleep at night because it really bothered me right. to watch it. Um, so impactful moments, do you think seeing some of these horrific things that go on is motivating in to keeping justice motivating to keeping justice I think it's an eye-opener to the to the jurors and the community what's going on here um, nobody wants to see what goes on behind the scenes so to say in a courtroom mm -hmm. from the sexual abuse to rapes to the murders to seeing a dead body it's 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 disturbing mm -hmm. um, I block it right out of my mind. Yeah. You know, I could do a trial and then uh, I'll try to forget about it. Right. People come up to me now and say, I was a juror on that case. What case is that? And they tell me the case and I won't even remember because mm -hmm. I don't want to. I just, yeah. it's gone. Once the case is over, that's the end of it. Yeah, you don't want those horrific sights in your mind. Correct. Yeah. Um, let me lighten it up a little bit. What do you look for in a court? room from people, whether it's attorneys or people who might be appearing or just, in front of you. I mean, we could even start with who's in your courtroom. So you're, yeah, you're on, a, on the bench. On the bench, you got the prosecutors, you got the defense attorneys, you got the defendants, you have the defendant's family, you might have the victim's family in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. you, and you, you, have, you have court staff, maybe tell the people. The staff, the, the court, court staff. reporter will be there, my clerk who takes notes about every single case and puts the notes into the computer. So. We, we can track a case. Uh, we got a court reporter who takes down every word that's spoken in the courtroom. Um, court security. Don't De forget court security. De Deputy she, 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 No, uh, she's gone. She retired. She was the she, best. She protected you for she many did. a year. Just, just, just last week we had a nice about fight outside the courtroom. Oh, really? <laughs> they wouldn't have stood for that. No, she would have been. Well, she would have been right in there, but they, they separated the combatants. It was somebody who was on for sentencing, and uh, two families sat on opposite sides of the courtroom. They got a little loud in the courtroom, and then they just took it outside the courtroom. So do people really get held in contempt then, like in that circumstance? I usually don't do that. That just 
pour, probably pours gasoline on a fire. Because yeah. they're all hot because their loved one was hurt and the other one's loved one's in custody over what they right. did. And so it's, it's emotional. Very, very emotional. Yeah. But in the courtroom, you know, when a defendant comes before me, I don't like him to be in a t-shirt or shorts. Okay. I'm one of probably one of the only judges that demands a, a proper decor when you come into court. You should dress like you're you're going to church on Sunday or to a okay. wedding. You should show some respect to the court. That to, to me is really important. And I'll, I don't like the hoodies. I don't like the white t-shirts or any t-shirts for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, like a button up or something. Correct. Or okay. a golf shirt or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of people don't know what to wear to court. No, no, they don't. They, I tell them, and then I make a note. They come back that way, then I make them come back the next week. Gotcha. Dressed up. I feel bad for the attorney because then the attorney has to come back, but <laughs> so be it. Well, I feel like it is. It, well, the going, attorney might want it if they've been practicing. They know. They know, right? The attorneys know what my rules are in the court. And, and most most judges' rules. If you remember when you were in my court, Matt Clark was the public defender and he had a collared shirt oh, yeah. in the podium. And if somebody came in a t-shirt, he'd take it outside and tell them to put it on. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Saves time. I had, I, in Rochester City Court, I had Jack Elliott and he was he was uh, tough on the shirts. He would tell him, Mary, that was his court clerk, adjourn for a shirt. <laughs> and he would put them on the next day every time. Um, and Sylvia Lopez was a public defender. She had small medium large extra large whatever size you need she Perfect. she's got uh, a blue polo for everyone works well i think well, it saved us a lot of time it sure that did was, that was good but i think this is great advice and something that you know a lot of people want to know because you guys are used to going into court and how it works for most people walking into a courtroom would be terrifying or intimidating oh it's very intimidating i can't imagine standing next to an attorney when your your freedom is really on the line because everybody that comes before me there's a possibility of state prison in the sentence mm -hmm. that's what makes it a felony by definition they've been indicted on a felony charge they can correct the minimum maximum sentence that would be minimum is always conditional discharge probation is possibility on oh. the lower level felonies but every every felony has a state sentence possibility that's why it's in supreme court and county court right. Even the lowest, an e-felony, you can do up to four years. Correct. So I, I can't imagine what it's like being a defendant standing next to an attorney. The defendant looks to that attorney for all the guidance in the world because they don't understand the system. And they count on that attorney to represent them zealously. And if you feel comfortable with your attorney, you're going to feel more, a little more comfortable in court. There's so many defendants who send me letters who complain about attorneys. Most of them I just blow off. Some I have to address with the attorneys, like they're not visiting me at jail. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk to the attorney, I say, go visit the guy in jail. You know, just spend some time with him, get him the discovery that he asked for. He wants to see the video, take the video over to him, whatever the case may be. Um, but some attorneys are better than others. Mm -hmm. Some are too busy to do it and but it gets addressed. Right. But I empathize with the defendant, especially one who feels that they didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know from practicing defense, that's part of the job of the lawyer, and that's what I hope we do. Uh, our, our, I've defended a lot of cases myself. I'm not doing a whole bunch of it now, but it's have you done the work before you walk into the courtroom? Or are you trying to figure out what's happening in the courtroom? That's not a good place to be. And when you start, as the judge, you start talking to me, and my guy starts chirping in my ear, and I turn to him and say, shut up. You have to. You, you better have established some rapport. Because when this guy's looking at going to prison, and you're telling him, I don't, you're not going to talk right now, I'm going to do this for you, you better have that trust. And, Correct. And you don't get the trust. You can't just get it. You don't get a signed trust. You don't get trust because the guy paid you some money. You have to have done the work. Absolutely correct. And you don't want that person writing letters to the judge about that, which is sort of violating that the, the trust. You don't complain to the, the judge unless it's really bad. And then, as you said, there's something wrong in the relationship. And it's tough on a defense attorney. Yeah, 
I think a lot of the defense attorneys bring it on themselves too. Not always. True, I've, true. I've, I've had some really tough clients who a lot of times it's usually mental illness um, or serious drug problem and mental illness. But a lot of the times some of your toughest clients can be the smartest clients. Correct. And, and they are sitting in a jail cell and they have – they're fixating on their freedom. Well, you can't blame a guy for fixating on his freedom and who's smart enough to do the research to understand what you're supposed to be doing and you're not doing it. Do you want to blame that guy or you want to take a look in the mirror? That's the... Right. And many times as an attorney, you have a chance to review the discovery. You've talked to the prosecutor. You know there's a reasonable offer on the table. Let's hypothetically say your client's out of custody and it's a charge that they're offering state prison. It's really difficult to convince your client to take an offer to go into prison from out of custody. Really hard, even though you know it, your attorney's telling you it's the it's a best deal you can get, yeah. and they don't wanna go. And as a, de as a defense attorney, you gotta say, well, you gotta really consider this offer because if you go to trial, He's not going to punish you for going to trial, which I would never punish anybody for going to trial. But if you get convicted of the higher offense when they're offering you a reduction, there's going to be more of a consequence. There has to be. Right. How often does that, have you seen that happen where there was a really good deal, they went to trial, and it actually went in their favor? Somebody gets acquitted? Mm -hmm. Or less acquitted? Or just, it yeah. happens. There's no question it happens. Mm -hmm. Is it often? No, it's not often. Acquittals are, are uh, I would say, probably I'm guessing 25% of the time. Okay. Of the top charge. I'm not saying you get acquitted of everything, but the top charge. Right. Interesting. So you alluded to it in the beginning. You talked about uh, you're probably more active in deals, negotiations, uh, what you accept, what you won't accept than other judges. Is Correct. That, so explain to the people who are listening what we're talking about by that. And you know what I'm talking about, but you have, so it's a, any plea bargain. We're talking about plea bargains. Let me just give a hypothetical yeah. example. Somebody's charged with a robbery in the first degree. They took a gun into a, a 7-Eleven and they pointed at the guy and give me all the money and he runs out. It's on video. And they make an offer to him of a robbery in the second degree, reduce reduction and they offer him probation. I'm not gonna go along with something like that where somebody actually points a gun at somebody else and they rob somebody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if he says that the gun was a BB gun and he was high on drugs and he has a drug problem he needs to address and he's not a bad guy. There still has to be a serious consequence for serious crimes. There's a yes. perfect so, example. So for the people who don't know, that you take a step back, any agreement is a three-way agreement. The prosecutor has to agree, the defense has to agree, and the judge has to agree. Most and, important, the judge has to agree. Well, if, if the prosecution and the defense can't come to some agreement, we never even get to the judge to ask for approval. True, unless the defense counsel says, Judge, what if I just plead to the charge? Will you give him probation? The DA's offering state prison, will you give them shock probation, which means right. do some time in jail, followed by probation. And that's when we sometimes get involved in the plea bargain. Yeah, that's like a, not a reduction though, that's a straight. Correct, plea, that's plea pleading to the top count or yeah, the whole indictment, right. The, um, but why do you think it is that you get involved more than some other judges? And I, I don't think I get more involved more than other judges. I think I take a tougher stance than most other judges. Well, I don't I go lot, along with the plea bargains. I think a lot of judges say, you're the prosecution, you're the defense. If you two can agree, I'm probably going to go along with it. They don't They don't stand in the way of a lot of deals. Um, That's very true. But uh, I, I'm just trying to make sure I'm... For, I know, I know. But give you the... the I'm just... I'm more... I'm tougher on people than yeah. but probably I think most of the judges. Well, in some ways, I think it also comes with the experience of the confidence of doing all these trials. Like right. th some judges don't want to do trials. That's the secret. There's a few judges that have been on the bench a, a long period of time and still have not done a trial. Right. So you would say that you're a tough judge, but is it because of the legal aspect or the being held accountable aspect? Or 
both. It's a combination of everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm fair. Mm-hmm. I'm fair. As I said, there's a lot of acquittals in my courtroom. I make sure everybody gets a very fair trial. Right. I can tell you, as the, I did, I prosecuted as many tri- uh, of his 400. I did as many as most, and he gave the defense a very fair trial. I um, have one good. question. Where does your love for the law come in? I have a different question. Do you love the law? Don't I? Of course, I. I'm love assuming the law. you do. But where did that come into play? What made you decide I want to become an attorney and uh, go on I didn't, this journey? My goal was not to become an attorney. I went to. Uh, he accidentally enrolled for law school. Hey. No, I went to law school because I wanted to be an FBI agent, and at that oh. time, the FBI was only uh, hiring lawyers. Okay. So my whole goal was to be an FBI agent. I got out of school. Um, as a matter of fact, they even took the CIA test. Didn't do very well on that one. But I went through the process with the FBI, and I did, then I just decided I wanted to go home. And I went back to Rochester mm-hmm. and started an internship at the DA's office. And... All of a sudden, one of the persons who was hired at the DA's office failed the bar. I passed it, and they offered me a job. That was took off from there. So ever since then, I loved the law. You loved the law. Yeah. It was never my goal ever to be an attorney. <laughs> never my goal to be a judge either. It just happened. I Acc- loved- accidentally got nominated for the Supreme Court twice. <laughs> accidentally, <laughs> well, correct. Yeah. yeah. So what do you enjoy about being a judge? If I could do a trial every single day, I'd be on trial every single day if I could. That's what yeah. I like the most. It's the funnest part. Fun, yeah. If you're comfortable, tell me about the trailers, the DA trailers they used to work out of. What? <laughs> so back in Henrietta, you had the town hall, and behind the town hall was two trailers. And I'm talking old trailers. And one half was the court. And then the other half was the New York State Police. And inside the trailer was the judge's chambers and the DA's office. And I was assigned to the DA's office out there for um, almost two years. I had the greatest secretary you could ever ask for because when you worked in the towns, you didn't have somebody hovering over you, uh, a superior, and they gave you some leeway. Mm-hmm. So if, if I wanted to go play some golf, I could go out and my secretary would say he was out meeting with the, some victims and cover, cover for me beautifully. Yeah, the, and the grass. It was just the, great. The, and then uh, we had a big, nice picnic table in the back and we were cooking out one day and I had my table grill. I left it on too long and the table caught on fire. Whole <laughs> 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 things up in smoke right outside the trailer. Within two weeks, they closed the satellite office and moved all the town people downtown. Oh, and no. All of the, the, the DA office has never recovered. <laughs> and it was all my fault. Uh, no. <laughs> well, at least you took accountability. <laughs> I did. Who was is, who is out in the trailers with you? Doug Randall, Dan Arelli were the two big ones when I was out there. What, what's the time frame on this? Like, how long ago? Was oh, that? we're talking in the... The late 80s. Okay. So we're talking a real long time ago. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, the trailers were demolished. The and DAs who worked back then, they all talk about these trailers. The, the, this was it was the, the greatest. The best practice of law, and, and uh, the cops would come to the trailers for the meetings. And, yep, you know, a lot of meetings at the, with the police there. They didn't have to go very far. It was the state police were right next door. And the judges were right there. Their chambers were right there, so you're talking to the judges all the time. and. Back in the old days, you're talking the 80s, every time we were done with court, we would go out to a local establishment, defense attorney, prosecutor, and the judge, Mm -hmm. and we'd go out for a couple hours. Almost every single time we had court. Mm -hmm. It was all night court. uh, You think that helped things get done? Oh, no question. Yeah, a lot of people, and Joan and John, they talk about that back in the the day. there was more of that around. There was a lot more socialization. Now, I don't even do that. I don't even go out anymore with the defense attorneys or prosecutors. It used to be after, in my when I started in county court, at least after a trial, 
we'd head to the local establishment with the defense attorney and prosecutor and obviously one would be happy the other wouldn't be but at least you'd go out with them and say you've gone through a long two weeks or three weeks on trial and just talk about what happened mm -hmm. and that's very beneficial to both the prosecutor and the defendant so. right the learning experience plus right. we talk about this a lot too like networking is a big part it sure of is being an attorney and why it's important and well in the criminal practice yeah you think you're good this week and guess ne next week you criminal defense lawyer, you're going to do some losing you're going to correct you're going to lose and you're going to get tough cases you're going to get tough clients uh they're not supposed to arrest innocent people a lot of the people are guilty you're going to you so you got to take take uh work hard and take the wins when you can get them but just because you win this one well guess what next week these roles could be reversed real fast real fast there's the presumption of innocence not the presumption of guilt and many of the defendants think that they're presumed guilty and especially with it as a defense attorney well they're gonna they have all this proof they're gonna find me guilty and, and the defense attorney says well yeah, there's this weakness here there's that weakness there this witness might not have seen what they saw etc and that's it that's what uh, I don't know. We were talking about so, the tr Go ahead. Sorry. No, I don't know. Would, would you want to talk about your campaign at all? No, oh, forget. We'll get to that. No, we'll, we'll get, get to that. that. Okay. We're just we're getting not... into the. Okay. The, okay. The judge uh, talking about the <laughs> talking about the people. This is what we finally broke them. The, uh, <laughs> we broke them. It is hot in here. <laughs> so I haven't well, said one thing inappropriate yet. No. Well, that's okay. We don't need <laughs> do you. Do you want to start? Well, just kidding. No. no so, I, but let's do a different hypo. So you have a person, a, a new, a new criminal defense lawyer. They've never done a case before. They come, and you started talking about this. The newer lawyers, but they're going to have a felony case where somebody can go to state prison and they're going to defend somebody. And everybody's got their first felony case. That's we right. all had it. You had That's it. And right. I had it. And all these other people. What would you tell that defense lawyer? Like, what do, what do, you, they're going to walk into your courtroom? What do you expect to see from that person? Well, as I said before, that defense attorney had better watch another trial, watch the jury selection, and be prepared. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it's not, you just can't pick up the file and say, well, that's my first trial. This guy's guilty. I'm going to go in there and just do the best I can and wing it. It'll be written all over the, the attorney. Yeah. You'll know how much or how little they prepared for the trial. You got to remember, a, a, a trial is almost like a show. It's like a TV show. And it's not for entertainment purposes. It's with a, a mission in mind for getting your client off or from the prosecutor's point of view to find somebody guilty. And they have to be prepared. And, and I can't stress that enough. You have, I'll tell you um, a lawyer. I'll tell you a lawyer who I think is one of the more underrated attorneys around here. You don't have to comment on it. Uh, our buddy James Egan. And he has a different approach to doing trials. He has an incredible trial record. Oh, he does. And he and I said, well, he's a machine. And I said, James, you know, why you do so much better than everybody else? He goes, I just go with the idea. Whoever knows the file better, probably going to win. It's true. Whoever knows the file, and it, it, if you're not the most experienced lawyer, if you don't, it, maybe you're not Tony Leonardo. Maybe you're not John Speranza. But if you know that file better than that other side. You got a pretty good shot. Okay, I got it. Here's my first trial that I did. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was out of the DA's office, and now I'm a, a defense attorney. And I'm not going to tell what, what say what the charge was, but I wrote out my opening statement, and I read it. When it came to the summation, I wrote it out, and I read it. And I regretted doing that from that point on, because you have to know the case well enough where you're speaking to the jury and looking at them so they believe you. Not reading something about what somebody testified to. You, yes, you can have notes like you have notes here. You can have bullet points, but you have to speak from the heart. And I think that's the most important thing for a new attorney. Um, you're going to read it the first time. Because those nerves are, your your legs are, yeah. they're shaking. You're grabbing the podium, so you steady yourself. I know what it's like, but as time goes on, you have to make yourself so comfortable with the case that you know what the defense is, that you know you're going to argue, and speak it. Don't read it. 
I like that. That well, because in a trial, a good trial attorney is not theatrical, right? But it's important to show that you believe it. Correct. Stand up when you object. Don't sit down from the. There's one attorney I picked on so bad. He yelled, objection. I ignored it. Objection. Ignored it. Third time, objection, even louder. And I said, excuse me? He goes, objection. I go, I can't hear you when you're sitting down. <laughs> so he stood up. <laughs> this is the, the joy of the good judge over here. Or there's a time like if it's the attorney just sits there, and I know the question is uh, an improper question. I'll just say sustained. <laughs> and the other attorney will go, there wasn't even an objection. I said, well, there should have been. I'm not going to allow it in. <laughs> That's not helping the other attorney out. But if something gets way out, yeah. way off base, and the attorney's daydreaming or writing a note that he's, yeah, well, I do what I need to do to make sure. And it probably depends on your attorney. But that is from the attorney perspective, sometimes I'm, I know the other question's no good. I'm not objecting because you're only highlighting the, then they get to ask the question twice. True, but sometimes I don't want I don't want to allow something that oh, yeah. is well. You, so you got to control. But right. there's a lot of questions that that are objectionable. The lawyer doesn't object to you. Got to go because we're trying to move along. Correct. Very true. You can't object on every question. Probably could, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't help your case usually. I'm always interested in when something gets like stricken from the record. If it's like a verbal thing that was said and there's a jury and they're like, oh, okay, pretend that didn't happen. How do you pretend that didn't happen? You still heard it. <laughs> That's true. And you give an instruction. Strike it from your mind, mind as best, best as, as humanly possible. possible. Okay. Correct. I've heard it a few <laughs> and times. A few thousand from times. Him. And then you say, you know, if you ask for a read back, you're never going to hear the objection being made, the answer being given, the court saying sustained and telling you to strike it from the record. It's like it never happened. Just like it never happened. That's what we have to make pretend. Okay. I'm always curious about that. Just because but of course <laughs> the jury can't get it out of their mind. Right. Or it's the question that tries to lead the witness down a particular road. Mm -hmm. And I sustain the objection and ignore the question. Of course the jury's mind is going to go down so, that road. i got a question for all these jurors. So 400 trials, that's... A lot of people. Almost <laughs> 4,000, what is it, 4,800 jurors that you've had? Uh... Is that right? Do your math. Times 12, what, 400, uh, four, what is that, 400 times 10? Times 100, 40,000, right? Well, why is it times 100? There's only 12 jurors on, oh, yeah, if but you're I bring 100 about, in the okay. panel. Well, okay, so I'm talking about the jurors, you're talking oh, about okay. the panel, but right. whatever. So there's okay. thousands of people from the community that have Correct. sat on your jury. They all know you. Correct. They remember, I, I've been to a juror one time, I remember Judge Renzi, he was a good guy. He let us go to lunch five minutes early. Whatever it is, he, he gave us a, a high five when the case was over. So these people see you in the community. Is it appropriate for them to talk to you, tell you oh, that they're they, on the juror? Yeah, that, absolutely, it happens every, almost every day. And so for that person who sees you, is it introduce themselves, that's okay, it's not, it's it's not disrespectful to you or, not the, or the case, okay. I mean, that's what I thought. But. I had this person come up to me at the sports club the other day. She came up to me. Do you remember me? No, I don't. You don't remember me? No. <laughs> How long ago? Oh, five years ago. Remember, I was the dancing juror. I go, no, I don't remember. <laughs> she goes, I go, what was the case? She goes, it was a sex abuse father against this child. I go, I'm sorry, I don't remember. She goes, don't you remember? I was the holdout juror that caused the mistrial. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I'm sorry, That's I don't funny. remember you. Oh. <laughs> well, but, you could have lied. You could have been like, yeah, no, but at least you're truthful. <laughs> no. I didn't ask which way the mistrial went, or whether she was the one for acquittal or convictions, but yeah. I don't like mistrials. Because I've got to try it all over again. Yeah, I was going to say. So that's the, the, your campaign, you're going all over. State, the, the western part of the state. So Eight counties. Us, so tell us about that geographic area and, and what that's like. I got to use my fingers. It's Monroe, Livingston, Steuben, Yates, Wayne, Seneca, Cayuga, and Ontario. 
So I got to travel through all those counties, parades, festivals. I started last September when my window opened, period, where I could go out and actually campaign. And I, I don't know, the first time I ran, I did 29 parades. This year, I've only done like 12, most a, of them. On a post? Are you on a post? No, I'm not on a post. Uh, well, I, the, okay. I got a quite, I got another question though. A serious question is: so judges are supposed to generally be apolitical, and that doesn't mean they don't have their own personal views. But you have to be political to become a judge. Correct. And then the job is supposed to be nothing to do with politics. Impartial. Right. So for 14 years, you're out of politics. Can't take your political views and express them in any way, except at home, and then. All of a sudden, the window opens up, and you can you try to curry the favor of the political parties. I'm trying to get tried to get the conservative endorsement, making sure I got the Republican endorsement. And you got and you both to, of those, right? I did, but you have to go meet with the leaders, and, you, and they ask you questions, not some dissimilar to what's asked today. But I can't tell them what my opinion is on the issues. The president. I can't comment on the president. I can't comment on what's going on in Congress. I can't comment on any laws other than I have to say I'm going to follow the laws. No matter whether I disagree with them or not, they're laws, and I'm bound by my oath to enforce those laws. You know, I could, you might ask what my opinion is on the Second Amendment. Could I go out and say something about it? No, but I could tell you that I support the Constitution of the United States because I take the oath as a town judge, as a county court judge, and as a Supreme Court judge, and I'm going to support the Constitution. And that system that we talk about, where you have to be political and then not political, do you agree with that? That the way that, do you think that's how it ought to be, or should it get changed some way? In, in my opinion, it should not change, and it should, you should not be able to give an opinion. And in my opinion, I mean, I know I'm not in the majority on this one. I think judges should run without a political party. I think they should be on the ballot. The Republicans could put us up, but put us on the ballot without a Republican or Democrat name. Make the people look into who the person is, what their experience is, what they've done, and make an educated choice for a judge. And then that takes the politics off the ballot, literally. Right. I agree with that. What about... In other states, and I'm familiar with the state of Iowa, I'm licensed to practice law in the state of Iowa. I got some friends out there. Uh, they appoint judges, and there there's a panel of appointment, and they have a farmer, a construction worker, a this guy, a that guy. And I guarantee you can't get on that panel unless you have some political views that agrees with that appointment. So that's even more dangerous. Yeah. And then my opinion. Yeah. Well, that's the then they appoint the person, and then they run. It's it's kind of crazy. Our system's crazy. The whole system's crazy. The well, judges got to only can be political in certain years, and you got to run for a period of time, and then you're out of the limelight. If I wasn't in the, the criminal part, my name would never be in the paper. It'd be 14 years, nobody would know what I'm doing unless you appeared in front of me. Mm -hmm. And that's tough. These guys who go to the appellate division, you know, their name only makes the paper if it's a decision that is controversial. And even then, it's just the one person who wrote it, not the, the, the others that agree. Nobody remembers those names. You talked earlier about the respect for the system and, and what people wear. But the system, I mean, I know I believe in it. You've been part of it for a long time. Uh, but it's, as a, as a judge, you control people's freedom. I mean, that's the, that is, is also... Uh, it weighs heavily. I, I, well, I was going to say there has to be a level of stress and pressure involved in that that people, people, you know, probably don't appreciate, right? You have no idea about the the, the pressure on a judge and what a judge thinks about all the time when he goes home, and what he takes home, what he sees during the day, and then try to go home and block it out. Sometimes I go home and watch a lot of Law, law and Order because I still enjoy the Law and Order oh. parts, but. <laughs> As my wife does, but um, there's so much that happens in the community that the people don't see. There's so much uh, violence in the community right now, 
and the laws are being criticized. Every paper you open up there, somebody's commenting on the bail laws or a judge is releasing somebody and they're out committing another crime and they criticize everything about the criminal justice system. And then you got the, uh, the Office of Court Administration pushing uh, for modifications of the laws and judges don't participate in that. We can be critical of it and if it's for the betterment of the, the system, but basically we're, we're gagged. And it's not, it's tough. It's interesting to me, you have judges of different uh, political parties and maybe different political views or views about how to be a judge, but then you see people in the Hall of Justice um, maybe have different political views, but you're friendly and behind, you know, in the, in the walkway behind all the courtrooms, you're still friendly with your colleagues. And I think- Of course. Th these are, there's not many people who really experience um, you know, that maybe that pressure that you're talking about or the experience, there's only, that's a pretty small pool. And to see, you know, that bond between judges kind of, um, I mean, I don't know, what's that like? We all respect each other's opinions. You have to. Um, people interpret the law differently. You know, I might find probable cause or not find probable cause. Another judge would do the exact same hearing and find the exact opposite. You still respect what they're they're doing. You don't bad mouth that judge or criticize that judge because that would be wrong. Uh, they're all they're all human beings. And yes, we have uh, breakfast every Thursday with all the judges. What's that we like? Talk. Well, it's interesting. It's it, we meet for about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes, and just tell stories of what happened in our court. Maybe something came up that everybody should know. Uh, we talk about that, and more of a social hour than of anything. Yeah. I always think that, like, the, you hear the stories of uh, RBG and Scalia, very polar opposites, and they're friends. And it, it's we we definitely leave politics out of those breakfast meetings. Yeah. That's probably uh, oh, you have a good idea. You have to, <laughs> yeah. even though we'd be allowed to talk about it because between judges, you could talk about anything. Mm -hmm. You get very dependent upon uh, the laws, but yeah, we we avoid it like the plague. Yeah, because people have strong views. When you, when I grew up, I have my values that were instilled by my parents. They have their values instilled by their parents. And their values and views may be totally different than mine, but still, you got to respect it. Right. Yeah. Uh, any any other parting words? Get out there, vote. Um, of course, get out there, vote. What else do you want to say? Anything, anything on your mind today? If anybody needs an attorney, I strongly suggest you use Bob King, one of the best attorneys in, in uh, Monroe County. <laughs> We've got clients in 30 states now. So. Do you really? Yeah. Thanks, Thank Bob. you. That concludes this episode of the King Law Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and check out our socials at King Law Attorneys. And if you've happened to have been injured or charged with a crime, now you know who to call. King Law. Take charge.